kids, for instance. So here we have the girl who has the uh, urethroceal that is presenting in the perineum, but perhaps some of the information that might be missing from the interpretation here is that she's got a pus-filled urethroceal, and maybe she's got the therapeutic option of a perineal incision rather than an endoscopic incision as part of what we might be able to do. And clearly, uh, Lewis focused on the examination of the perineum, and I think that's one of the things that we are missing in our medical community. Kids are coming into hospitals, being admitted with urinary tract infections without people going to the extent of examining their perineum. So I thought that was a very good point that he presented. And also in a child who comes in with a urinary tract infection, the examination of the perineum, but also of the sacral region. And he showed this marvelous picture of a neuropathic bladder that was evident by looking at the uh, lumbosacral spine and seeing that there was an abnormality there. So I uh, commend that point that he was making to the audience very strongly. And then he also talked about the foreskin, but I think this is an area where we can learn a lot more. Clearly there are populations where there's a high circumcision rate, but there are other populations where we have low circumcision rates where we need to consider the state of the foreskin and rather than just whether it's a tight foreskin and whether or not removing the foreskin might reduce the infections, as was pointed out from the study from 2005 by Lewis, if we go and look at that study in a bit more detail, they actually said that the risk benefit analysis may not favor circumcision, even in the higher risk populations. So we need to be careful about how we interpret the studies because sometimes when you read a previous investigation, you can actually draw two different conclusions out of it. So I, my practice is that if you've got affected kidneys, then why not remove the foreskin just in case it does actually cause an additional problem. But I don't think the jury is in about the state of the foreskin, because when you go and look at that 2005 study and you search the word anatomy, it is only mentioned once. So the um, random, looking at the randomized trials and observational studies, they haven't actually looked at the state of the prepuce to decide whether the foreskin was a contributor. They've just said the presence of the foreskin was a contributor. So I think that's something that we're missing the opportunity of looking at at the moment. So I think if you've got a foreskin like this, where you, when you look from laterally, you see it coming to a short dome, you see a little pouting edge where you can actually see the glands through it, then that's physiological phimosis. And I wonder whether that is associated with an increased risk of uh, infection. Whereas this is very different. When you have a dome shape, when you look from uh, laterally and you see a pinhole with scarring, then this is probably associated with an increased risk of urosepsis, maybe balanitis, and maybe uh, upper tract infection as well. But I don't think we've done the detailed study to look at the association of this anatomy to the psychoureteric reflux. And so a child who presents with the megalo uh, prepuce, with the ballooning, with basically the retention under the foreskin, I think it's quite a shame if they end up with a cystogram being done. If they've got a normal ultrasound and they've had local sepsis from the clinical scenario, then clearly they've got a foreskin problem that needs to be dealt with, not DMSA, cystogram, same down the line as a boy who might have a retractable foreskin. And if this is the anatomy of the foreskin of this boy who is not circumcised, then I don't think this foreskin would have anything to do with an episode of up, upper tract urosepsis. So I would like to see that we look at the foreskin anatomy as part of the study as to whether or not it might be a problem. But if you've got a foreskin that's got a closed distal opening and you've got affected up, upper tracts, then preserving nephrons by doing a circumcision, I don't have a debate with. Lewis, uh, in his presentation on the 11th, also mentioned labial adhesions. I think it's interesting to note on his picture here, there is actually a drop of urine that might be coming from retention of urine above the labial adhesions. And I note on this picture, that there's probably been some separation of the labia quite easily. 
by it being spread with the fingers. And if you go and look at the research about labial adhesions, there's still a lot of debate. I don't think we're doing the research that tells us what to do at the moment. But I've had the clinical experience of being asked to go to radiology to separate the labial adhesion so the radiologist could do the cystogram that had been ordered by a paediatrician. So clearly we haven't quite got it right in terms of the understanding of the role of labial adhesions in the need for investigation. And I think that's another body of work that needs to be done. Uh, personally, I believe that if you've got labial adhesions and you've got a significant urinary tract infection where the labial adhesions result in there being no, virtually no hole, then it's not unreasonable to separate those labial adhesions. And if the ultrasound was normal, I probably wouldn't do a cystogram. I think what we're missing is looking for the difference between those things that seem similar. So that what's the labia like? What's the foreskin like? And a little bit like uh, the piano. If you just look at the black and white, then you're not getting all the information about what is in front of you. If you look at the shape of the white keys, you get a little bit more information. If you look at the position on the piano, you haven't got all the information because what if the piano is out of tune? So you then have to go seeking for what happens when you hit that key. And that kind of further information seeking is the model that I'd like to see us apply to the psychiatric reflux. If we go to the animal kingdom, it helps understand that seeking further information perspective. So if you look at the cheetahs, uh, go to Africa and you look at these cheetahs, you can see a slightly different size, but which is which, and if you saw them separate from the others, you wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to tell. A little bit like when I see the hydronephrosis as the a previous grading system showed, one, two, three, four. I think there's a lot of differences within one, a lot of differences within four that we're not currently seeing because we're not looking for the detail. We're not looking for the different spots on the different cheetah. And likewise with the grading system of a psychiatric reflux, we're not detailing the upper tract and detailing the ureter enough to be able to see which cheetah is which. So I like this idea that uh, grade one in the animal kingdom is the cheetah. They're all different. Grade two is the giraffe. Grade three is the zebra. They're all different, but we see them as the same and on and on. And then if, if you have a, a little bit of knowledge, you can pick the difference between one and the other. The black rhino has a different shaped mouth and is eating from a tree. The white or wide mouth rhino eats from the ground and it has a flat, flatter snout. But if you look at the wrong end, you can't actually tell the difference. And here was a case where, and I'll detail it a little bit later on, where the problem was they were looking at the wrong end. Initially, they were looking at the fact that there was reflux and missed the fact there might have been an intermittent PUJ obstruction. And I'll tell the rest of the story in a moment. So what we're missing is the difference between those things that seem similar. And another example from the Middle East, uh, some may be familiar with the uh, movie The Pirates of the Caribbean and of the imposters uh, at Petra uh, in Jordan of Jack Sparrow, who was the character in The Pirates of the Caribbean and the star of that movie was Johnny Deep. So when I went to Petra, I saw all these guys that guy looks really familiar because I had seen the movie, but I didn't really know the character. So the real Jack Sparrow was in the top right. But if you didn't know enough, you thought you might have been seeing the same guy again and again and thought you might have been seeing somebody you'd seen before. So in order to be able to see the difference, you've got to collect the available data. You've got to look for the variables that allow you to see the difference. So coming back to the African scenario, and if I can ask you just to watch the screen carefully just now, if you're an expert in African birds, that's what you would have seen in that brief flash because it, those African trackers have been trained in identification of the differences even in that sort of flash. And that was an experience I had where uh, people were able to see that difference, just like some people can pick a song from the first bar. 
So now that you've had training in Jack Sparrow identification, you probably recognize that this is one of the imposters, but you will be able to be a little more certain when I put that guy in the context of the others. And this is the concept that I think we need to be looking for to be expanded for the psychoureteric reflux. So if you could just watch the screen again carefully now, with a lot of experience, you might have seen that there was contrast on the right in what appeared to be a duplex system and very little contrast on the left in a system that is poorly defined. But if I give you the fact that the one on the left is a cystogram and the one on the right is an IVU, you might then be able to see that it's a duplex system into which there's reflux from the bladder, which has a filling defect and on function study, there is no function of the left side because that urethroceal is obstructing both the upper and the lower pole of the duplex. So it's a great example of um, more knowledge, more information, and looking for more information gives you that answer. And when it comes to the psychoureteric reflux, I think this is how well we understand the jigsaw puzzle of any individual patient at the moment. We're seeing a few pieces of the puzzle turned over. We're seeing a lot of pieces of information that are missing. And I think that is so for both the diagnosis and for the intervention, particularly with the development of the injectable treatment with some of the laparoscopic procedures, we're getting more intervention options, but we're not really developing a science of knowing where they fit. And that's made quite problematic because there's a lot of research happening by all the players you see on this list, the pediatricians, the nephrologists, the ultrasonologists, the sonographers, all contributing to potentially understanding, but in some ways misleading a little. So if we come back to this child that I showed you before, where the focus from the generalist managing this girl was on the psychoureteric reflux, and there was nuclear medicine studies being done, but only a DMSA study. So here's a child who presented in 2005, the age of two, 2006, she had a very good functioning left kidney with uh, no suggestion of obstruction because she was not having a MAG3, she was having the DMSA study. She then presented in 2014, having had recurrent urinary tract infections, but people had missed the fact that there was intermittently uh, increased dilatation of the lower pole. And in fact, she had uh, lower pole PUJ obstruction, which wasn't confirmed on the MAG3 study because inadvertently no Lasix was given and therefore an IVU was conducted. And you can see that she had the evidence of the obstruction. But in fact, then the uh, presence of the reflux was forgotten. So that when she presented three months later after a pylopexy, uh, the fact that she had debris in the bladder and since she's had multiple recurrent urinary tract infections, now being a 17 year old girl who's pregnant with stones in her kidney and she had an obstructive ureteric stone, fortunately, that passed spontaneously. So another generalist patient that I've seen is uh, this little boy who had a prenatal diagnosis of hydronephrosis with uh, the um, left kidney where postnatally the kidney didn't look particularly dilated, but the upper ureter looked dilated. This child presented with meningitis with E. coli that was also in the urine. And people initially were focusing on the fact that there was reflux. And they thought it was grade five reflux. But if you look carefully, there's rather a mismatch between the ureter and the pelvis. This in fact was a cystogram diagnosed intermittent PUJ obstruction in a child who was presenting with pain with feeds, and that was confirmed on a MAG3 study. So reflux can be a distraction, and we need to look at this lateral view, which I'll come to later as well. So let's see it, the psychoureteric reflux as a jigsaw puzzle, both for diagnosis and for intervention. And in this case, uh, and this was discussed in the last two sessions with the Saudi group, where you've got a very distorted system on the right here, very little function. This was 
a uh, little easier than the case presented at one of these previous sessions where such poor function, removing that kidney would uh, be very reasonable. Uh, to remove all of the ureter down to the bladder and re-implant the left ureter, for me, would need to be empowered by more information about the ureter into the bladder on that left side. And we got some good information from, from Andy who uh, presented at the session in May on the vesicoureteral reflux index, where there was a particular focus on the early reflux. So uh, a high score is given if there's early reflux during the uh, cystogram. And this girl with the uh, female with high grade reflux and early filling ends up being in a high risk group where she's therefore at more risk of having surgery. But what we can also add to the formula that Andy so cleverly gave us is to not only look at this further child, uh, at the fact that she's had early reflux on the left, but then she's had very full calyces on the right when a bladder has been full. But importantly, an hour after the cystogram, she still had a very full upper tract. So drainage of the upper tract is one of the parameters that we could be focusing on more than we currently are. And this girl clearly has a system that is likely to be in trouble. So not only the emptying of the upper tract, but the appearance of the lower ureter. So when we treat the psychiatric reflux surgically, we're focusing on the anatomy of the lower part of the ureter, but it hasn't been the focus of the studies that we've done in the past. And, and so here, this gives the radiological assertion that there's a golf hole orifice. And to be able to correlate this radiology with that endoscopy and knowing some of the research on the endoscopy, that could help us. So here we have another example. If you're looking at the, the lateral view, we're seeing a short distance for a big ureter. It's likely to be a ureteric orifice that is not going to stop refluxing into the future. And perhaps it's an ectopic ureter. In fact, this one wasn't. But that's one of the things that we might learn by looking at that lateral view. And then in this case, quite a small ureter but complex anatomy down at the psychiatric junction with a diverticulum that would uh, encourage you to go seeking further information about what to do for that patient. And Lewis in his presentation very appropriately pointed out that uh, the, and he showed the lateral view, but didn't particularly comment on that. He did, however, highlight that the new nuclear cystogram doesn't give us that anatomy and should be used for follow-up. And I do concur with that view. And I don't think uh, cystogram should be used for the diagnosis of phimosis, so that uh, hopefully um, one could manage that differently. And not only do we find the psychiatric reflux, and in this case, it looks as if it's probably not that significant, although there is some change in the back wall of the bladder, but there is an outpouching on the back of the urethra, which one might be concerned about as the etiology of the urinary tract sepsis and not so focused on the reflux. In girls, um, we haven't in these discussions had much of a focus on the spinning top urethra. It was in one of the cases back in May. But therefore, if you've got the psychiatric reflux in a girl with that sort of urethra, then I would, I would be focusing on that urethra, not on the reflux. And particularly in this dramatic spinning top urethra where the balloon is down in the distal urethra with a significantly trabeculated bladder, uh, I would uh, suspect that that reflux is a very minimal part of her pathology. And if you go to the case that was presented, Fahad, thank you for presenting the eight-year-old girl uh, in May. Um, no um, prophylaxis, no urinary tract infections. Um, I wonder whether that was the pace that had been subsequently injected. And I would be focused on what was happening with the urethra and to decide what to do with this reflux. If I had have been led to doing a cystoscopy, uh, 
I would want to know the anatomy of that ureter endoscopically before deciding what to do. So when that question was raised, that was the question in my mind. And I would particularly want to go back to the history of that patient and find out whether she's a squatter with bladder instability that is yet to be managed. So has she, is she not talking about the symptoms? Has she actually got squatting that needs to be managed? And the control of that bladder instability might resolve the reflux. So if I was to cystoscope her, this is what I'd be looking for, whether she's got um, a reasonably small orifice or a big gaping orifice to decide whether or not I would treat her um, surgically. So again, try to turn over more of these uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces by asking the question from the patient, the history, the examination and the investigations. And uh, Richard Lyons, uh, Marshall and Tanago in 1969 talk, taught us that the lateral orifice that is golf hole uh, was unlikely to resolve its reflux. And we seem to have gone away from reviewing the anatomy in our decision as to whether or not we might intervene. So clearly with an, a ureteric orifice that looks like this, this was uh, just an incidental for another reason, scoping the patient, normal ureteric orifices with this slightly different approach, um, different appearance being one that I'd want to be going back to looking at the studies to see whether there might be an obstructive component. There's no obstructive component then clearly there doesn't need to be in any intervention. And when there is an orifice that does open a little when you flush the fluid through, I might want to measure the ureteric tunnel, but that would be an uncommon thing for me to do. But I don't think putting the cystoscope to the orifice and running contrast through the scope as is done in the positional installation of contrast cystography I don't think that really tells us whether or not we should operate. I think that's reflux phenomenon through investigation, not necessarily identifying reflux disease. But if you look at the orifice and with a 9.5 scope, you can easily go into that ureter. And I think that tells you that the other things that you're looking at, if they equal consider surgery, then this would add to that uh, decision direction. And if there's large periuretric diverticular as shown here with the ureter exiting here, then that would also influence me to uh, proceed to surgical intervention. And what I think we could do uh, and more information we could gain, and um, that is to routinely record our endoscopies so that if paste is injected, and this is a Teflon injection case, where you have a beautiful crescent on top of a mound if we have that documentation, then when we go back, in this case that presented, um, I don't use deflux. Um, this was a case who came to me after deflux treatment. There'd been almost a mill of paste injected on this right side. And you can see that the um, paste is uh, above and lateral to the orifice and a little bit of paste just here where there's a bit still a very wide open ureteric orifice in a girl with reflux on the cystogram and with recurrent urinary tract infections with uh, changes on the BMSA. So intervention and diagnosis, I think information collection to allow us to know not only what intervention to engage in, but what the impact of that intervention has been subsequently. So we've looked at the difference between similar cases, looking at the expert recognition, the sense of the jigsaw puzzle turning over the pieces. I'd like to now talk about the Patch Adams fingers, and it comes from the movie of Patch Adams. One of the scenes talks about seeing more by looking through and recognising that each data point is on a spectrum where there's a wide spectrum for most of those data points. So from the movie, it was the sense that if you are looking at the ultrasound, look at that through the clinical history, or if you're looking at the DMSA study, look at that through the ultrasound so that you can see more in one study by looking at through another. So there's lots of different bits of information from the clinical history, a little bit of the jigsaw puzzle from the fetal ultrasound down to whether or not there's a wetting problem. On the examination from what's the blood pressure to what was the temperature 
when the child presented. And then on the investigation, renal ultrasound number one, renal function, obviously, if the, if the ultrasound shows changes, the uh, nuclear medicine study shows changes, then we're looking at that. And my approach has been, and there was some discussion about this in the previous presentations about recommendations for different indications for ultrasound. Um, I have a low threshold to do an ultrasound. Um, I raise that threshold a little by saying a child should have an ultrasound if they've got a urinary tract infection with a raised white cell count. So I have a very low bar um, and I, I see it as an extension of the clinical examination rather than really an investigation. And it's good to see that there's some studies coming out that are looking at trying to find more information in that ultrasound. And this was the multidisciplinary consensus classification in Journal of Pediatric Urology recently. And what they've done is to try and strategize to look at low risk, intermediate risk and high risk by looking at um, particularly the um, different configuration of the calyces, but looking to see that there's higher risk you've got ureter abnormalities and bladder abnormalities. So seeking more information out of the ultrasound, uh, including studies that have looked for the vesicoureteric reflux where the flow into the bladder, the flow out of the bladder, uh, the reflux here, uh, out of the bladder and the flow into the bladder. So again, it's the ultrasound value adding to the interpretation. And looking at urothelial thickening, the um, jury's not in on this one. There's been a couple of different studies that have been done that uh, don't allow us to say, yes, it equals reflux, and therefore we need to consider, but perhaps an, it's another parameter that can be included in the jigsaw puzzle. We in Melbourne have looked at the calyx to parenchymal ratio to look at the well-being of the kidney, particularly in the obstruction. And you can see not only the eggshell sign, which seems to be an indication of raised pressure, which perhaps can come from the reflux, but this, these pictures also show the different configuration of the calyx that perhaps is important. But this rim of echogenicity uh, does seem to correlate with some raised pressure. And then we haven't reflected enough, I don't think, on the full bladder compared to the uh, empty bladder upper pole calyx and looking to see whether we might have seen reflux during that study. But there are other investigations that we could be looking at, which certainly complicate the investigation of any individual patient, but might allow us to understand better into the future whether we should be operating on those children. So the beta-2 microglobulin and other renal tubular markers have been investigated in these studies in 1996 and 2019. Uh, this one from 2000 um, purported that the alpha-1 microglobulin is diagnostic of VUR. I think there's uh, more to be studied to uh, understand that conclusion. And Bartoli and Pastori uh, showed that the uh, EGF and MCP, markers of renal injury, uh, can be useful in monitoring the outcome of surgery. Obviously, we want to be able to monitor whether or not surgery should be used as well. And when we look at hydronephrosis and the fetal perspective, there's lots of different bits of information that we need to be able to interpret what's happening. There's maternal factors, fetal factors, more fetal factors, fetal and other, which come to a big long list, which is only part of what we need to be seeing. We need to then look at nuclear medicine, the postnatal ultrasound, the operative findings, which I don't think we're adding to our body of understanding adequately at the moment to be able to direct us in the future. And our late follow-up for um, the deflux injection, I think we're missing an opportunity by not doing some of the investigations that might allow us to understand a little better into the future. Um, and as Lewis said in his presentation, take into account the child's symptoms. I think the uh, development of the investigation and the course of events for the patient needs to be driven by what's happening for the patient, not driven by the investigation results that come out of uh, the patient coming to our attention.
And uh, Marty Coyle certainly outlined a lot of the different um, perspectives of how we pull together the jigsaw puzzle. Some of these pieces of the puzzle that are turned over, we know the age of the patient, we know the age of the diagnosis, and we need to consider what's the ability of the family and what is their preference uh, for the treatment. And I think part of our problem with the psychoureteric reflux is that it's a phenomenon. Uh, it's not actually a diagnosis. It's like saying somebody's constipated. That's a phenomenon. It doesn't really tell us what is the cause or what is the management, uh, just like saying a patient has a rash. <clears throat> and Marty uh, suggested in May that we should uh, read the study that was published in April uh, this year on the psychoureteric reflux. Is it uh, important to find? So I uh, did as I was told and was pleased to see that VUR symptom was this case as an example. But I think, uh, are the calyces there normal in the configuration? And I don't see the lateral view of the ureter and bladder. So there's more information I would want to know. And a lot of the studies that we see now refer back to the Birmingham study group study of 1987, the International Reflux Study Group study, uh, published in uh, 1981. But they don't drill down to the detail where the Birmingham study had no DMSAs and only had a three grade system. And more than half the patients treated medically still had reflux at five years. And then if you look at the International Reflux Study Group study European arm, um, you see that the success for the ureteric reimplant was only 93%. And that's not my experience, and that's not what is mainly reported. And it was disappointing to see that three of the lead beta politano ureteric reimplants were actually through the intestinal wall. And 20 new scars, the 20 new scars in the operative group, six had had a post operative obstruction. So I suspect we still haven't had a good test of the surgical management of the psychoureteric reflux from that study. And despite the fact that there were uh, problems with the surgery, uh, the conclusion was thus the ideal non-obstructive reimplant is superior to medical management. And importantly, pyelonephritis is more common in medically treated patients. So I think there's, there's more for us to read out of those previous studies and more work to be done. And going back to the paper that Marty said that we should look at, um, the conclusion was in high-grade dilating VUR, um, results from perspective, what we still need is results from prospective studies in this population. We do not know whether interventions such as ureteric reimplant or antibiotics um, to address the VUR will prevent or retard. So they're saying that we still don't know in high-grade VUR. So is it important to find? Well, the answer is we don't actually know what we should be doing. So therefore it is important to find. And then if we go and look at the reflux disease picture in that article, I wonder whether a PUJ obstruction as well as reflux is happening for this child, particularly with such a poor kidney. I think one of the assumptions we're making at the moment is the kidney is poor, it was congenitally abnormal, Whereas what we should say is we do not know whether it was abnormal because it was going to be abnormal or abnormal because of the reflux. And I'll, I'll come to why I think that so strongly um, later on. So one of the things that seems to be part of um, the Quran or gospel of the psychiatric reflux at the moment is that the DMSA was normal or abnormal. Whereas According to Rushton in 1988, uh, it's only 87% sensitive. And there've been some other studies looking at the histology versus the DMSA changes that would suggest that we shouldn't over-focus on the DMSA, we should look at the whole of the picture. And particularly if it's a small kidney without focal scarring, perhaps we're actually missing detail in that sense too. I'm pleased to say that I've had a discussion recently with uh, Tej Mato about uh, the RIVU study, and uh, we're going to be trying to look at some of the detailed anatomy of the cystograms to try and uh, reinvestigate some of the work that they've done in the RIVU study. So what I've 
done in my work is to say, this seems to be very confusing. We're not getting the answer as to where we should go. Let's go back and look at the fetus. And if you look at this case, this was a boy with big dilated kidneys, big dilated bladder, without urethral obstruction. He had um, the psychiatric reflux only. So we went off uh, and followed the work of Craig Peters and Rita Gobe looking at the psychiatric re reflux in a fetal model, but their fetal sheep model required obstruction of the uracus. So we went to the pig because of the work of Ransley and Wisdom looking at the pig model for the psychiatric reflux. So in Melbourne, we uh, took these very big, supposedly small pigs and operated on the fetus in the last trimester. And you can see here the pair of scissors under what is a little canopy of the tunnel. It's, there's a, a golf hole and then a little canopy that runs to give the tunnel. So pigs virtually never reflux unless you induce it surgically. And these are some of the results that we had. And here we have um, caused unilateral reflux. In this case, we caused bilateral reflux. And what you see in those with unilateral reflux, the comparison of the kidneys, we can see that there's a morphological change in the refluxing kidney compared to the non-refluxing kidney. There's a lot more work to do with this model and I'd be delighted if other people would take up doing this research because I think it could tell us a lot into the future. So what we concluded from that study was that surgically induced VO in the last trimester of the fetal pig produces change in the configuration of the pelvic thalassal system. Um, some other work, um, contrary to the Ransley Risden uh, conclusion, uh, which was that you had to have infection to cause any injury into the kidney, was by Tony Atala's group looking at a pig and finding that there was a mild focal chronic interstitial inflammation and fibrosis after a year if you created the psychiatric reflux. So I think the ideal future research would be to take that animal model to create fetal VUR in the one gender, so you didn't confuse the information from the study. You use markers of renal injury in addition to studies such as histology and DMSA. You do look at the DMSA changes, but you also look at nephron counting. And once you've got that model set up, you then randomize the treatment arms, surgery, conservative management uh, with or without antibiotics. Uh, and that's where I think we'll get a lot more clarification. So it's a jigsaw puzzle where both diagnosis and intervention, really there's a lot of pieces that we're not looking at the moment. So where do I think we should be in the future about operating? I think we should operate when we can predict a better outcome from surgery than no surgery, which obviously, is a motherhood sort of statement. When do I operate? When I have a sense that I'm seeing the picture of this patient. So when I've got enough pieces where I can understand what I think might be the best option for the patient that I've got in front of me. I think big parts of the jigsaw puzzle are the greater reflux, the wide ureter, and obviously whether or not there's changes on the DMSA, and the configuration of the uh, ureteric orifice. They're the big parts of the jigsaw puzzle. They're not all the bits of the information that I take to make that jigsaw puzzle. And what I do do is the Cohen ureteric reimplant. Uh, and I do that without catheters based on some information that was published in 1981, decreased post-operative discomfort and markedly shortened hospital stay by not using a catheter. Then in 1993, uh, Brandell and Brock said we could no longer continue to randomize because of the remarkable improvement in the post-operative course with no catheter. So in the first 167 patients that I've operated on without a catheter, and this is not every case should have no catheter. You have to select appropriately. But in those that um, did not have a catheter appropriately, 78% of them needed only oral analgesic. The catheterized ones were my own patients prior to that. And you can see that they are having epidural anesthesia. And this is a boy who was 12 hours post-op giving me the thumbs up saying he's pretty happy with having no catheter. 
So thank you very much for the previous presenters uh, giving us some stimulating material to debate and to the Saudi uh, Pediatric Urology Group for allowing me time to present. What are we missing? There's a lot out there, but uh, hopefully we can find it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Patty. I mean, it's been uh, a very beautiful, enlightening um, uh, approach to a very interesting, I would say, and uh, enjoyable subject uh, for all pediatric urologists. Uh, however, uh, it carries always some sort of uh, challenges that we need to be open-minded uh, we, when we approach uh, this entity. So um, I would like to congratulate you for, for touching it from a sort of a different kind of perspective that need always to be kept in our mind, uh, keeping uh, our wisdom always and um, uh, our, our understanding uh, of the patient, uh, the caregivers, and um, uh, how uh, the, uh, the evaluation of reflux uh, should be probably targeted towards the outcome and how it would uh, affect the ultimate outcome on the kidney function rather than uh, being able to diagnose it uh, or evaluating it. So I think uh, I would like uh, to congratulate you for, for a nice uh, elaborative talk uh, touching a very, very important uh, subject. Uh, if you allow me, Professor uh, Diwan, I have a couple of uh, questions uh, that probably we can touch bases uh, upon it. And then probably we can alternate me and Dr. Fahad uh, just to go uh, through a couple of them. So uh, the first one is that um, uh, in your view, uh, uh, would you probably approach a patient uh, in, in 2020 uh, if he presented to you through a postnatal screening uh, differently than if uh, he or she presented to you post uh, breakthrough urinary tract infections? Uh, yeah, I, one of the points I didn't make um, in the presentation was the sense that our patients, when they're born, are usually nine months old. So that if there is a patient who presents with urosepsis, I still go back and find the fetal material. And unfortunately, our system isn't geared in Australia yet to readily have that available. It's almost like the birth gets a different being. Instead of it being uh, in the child's record, you have easily available information about the first nine months of their life. So if somebody, if a child presents with hydronephrosis, urinary tract infection, or their kidneys are normal, I will always try to seek the fetal history as part of that evaluation. I think it, um, there, there, is a, there is a difference. I think the presence of a urinary tract infection does shift the goalposts, but it brings me back usually to say, yes, they've got an ultrasound that might have an abnormality. Yes, they've had a urinary tract infection, but do they drink enough? Do they clean their perineum enough if they're a girl? Have they got a retractable foreskin? So I come back to the basics first. So the ultrasound, I'm saying, why not do it in all those who present with a urinary tract infection? But having recommended that investigation, the really important focus I have is on the rest of the clinical aspects of the patient before I go delving into what's happening with the further investigation except if there's a significant abnormality on the ultrasound. So if the ultrasound suggests that they may have um, a neuropathic bladder or they've got potentially some obstructive component to what might be the psychiuroteric reflux, then I have no hesitation to be going off and uh, delving into that um, relatively early. Um, I, don't, I certainly don't take the approach that um, treating and seeing whether they might resolve over a period of months and years. So the idea of doing a cystogram at a year, a cystogram at two years, a two-year-old having another catheter inserted to investigate whether they've got reflux, um, I don't think is uh, help, 
it's a very difficult study for the child to have done. And therefore, I'd rather identify that they need to have the reflux earlier in life treated, or they're going to have the reflux able to be managed without intervention so that you don't have to do the multiple repeat cystograms to manage the patient. Um, I, I would prefer us to be able to judge that you're going to need to do that investigation rather than continue to do the investigation into the future. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I will probably hand it uh, to Fahad now. Uh, Fahad. Uh, Fadi, thank you for a great uh, talk. And I think as Dr. Ziad mentioned, it's very interesting to see different views and different way of doing it. A question from one of the audience. Do you think there is a place for a temporary diversion in the treatment of reflux in young kids? Um. Yes, I, I, I do think so. Um, the fetus that I showed with the markedly dilated upper tracts and big bladder, um, I think one of the phenomena that may be occurring is that child has reflux, but perhaps have they had reflux early enough in fetal life and the nature of the response has been that they've actually got a cycling bladder that has become like mitral regurgitation so they've developed a bladder abnormality secondary to the reflux. Um, and in that sort of situation, you've got a very young baby where you're not sure of what their bladder is doing. So doing a vesicostomy as a temporary procedure. And once you do a vesicostomy, you know, it's a, um, a many months before one would uh, want to reverse it, um, uh, at least a year if you're gonna do that early. So I think, yes, there is, there is a role, but it is a situation where you have to have all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle coming together to say, this is an outlier where that option is, um, seems to be the best, but certainly a vesicostomy in a boy with very high grade reflux, we are not really sure whether or not he's got a bladder that is contributing to it. And it may be that this sort of mitral incompetence type phenomenon might be occurring in that clinical scenario. So going in the same line here, uh, see that if you're serious, you have a four weeker baby who had a reimplant. So this take us to the question, what's your experience with doing reimplant in infant less than six months of age? And I've, uh, I think one of your patient was four week old. So uh, yeah. patient, would you do visicostomy, would you reimplant? Uh, and doing it early. I know there is some evidence supporting that it's doable and safe. How practical is that? So what's your experience? Yeah, um, the, the four-weeker was very much an, an outlier and um, the, the kind of situation where doing a diversion is an option. And um, I'm very comfortable with operating um, in the bladder of a very young baby. <clears throat> in a scenario where that seems to be the best option for that patient. So I agree, don't, you're not in a hurry. You've got to keep the child infection free, uh, operating very early. Uh, if, you, if you don't have the confidence that you're uh, likely to get a successful outcome, then managing the patient conservatively is fine. But if you think you might have an obstructive component as well as reflux, then I think you need to do something rather than wait for the obstruction that is going to be the thing that's the, uh, a very significant concern uh, in nephron loss to be able to be uh, dominating. And that, that was the case with the four, four week old. There was an obstructive reflux, similar to that case I showed you where the upper tracts didn't uh, empty very well at all, uh, despite the emptying of the bladder. Um, thank you again, pa uh, Patty. I mean, there's another question from uh, one of the audiences. Um, uh, if intervention deemed necessarily, uh, would you uh, probably um, uh, prefer one sort of an option uh, compared to others? Uh, for example, endoscopic versus uh, open uh, versus laparoscopic or nowadays with robotics? That's the first part of the uh, question. And what about those with a high grade of reflux? If you're speaking about grade three, uh, four, and five, 
would you approach it initially with an endoscopic uh, procedure compared to an open reimplant, for example? Yeah, um, good questions. Um, if I can just highlight one of the things I said during the presentation, I think one of one of the things we're not doing enough of at the moment is documenting the surgical findings. Um, that's particularly so for PUJ obstruction, but it's also the case for vesicuretric reflux and particularly for the endoscopic management. Um, I had the pleasure of being involved in the research that was done in Dublin um, after the procedure had been developed by Barry O'Donnell and Prem Puri. Um, I was looking at a lot of the, the studies that were being done in the time that I was their fellow. And what, what I noticed and what I subsequently showed in my research was that if you use 0.3 mil of Teflon paste, so my experience is in Teflon, which I don't use now, if you use 0.3 mil of paste and you have that mound that I showed you in the picture earlier, then you have a very high incidence of reflux resolution. But uh, for grade five with a golf hole orifice, the success rate is very poor, 60% uh, or thereabouts. And what I'm not hearing at the moment is that people are focusing on getting that mound that produces that reflection of likely success. And I don't think we're in the routine of documenting those to compare the before and after in each of our cases so people can go back and look at their cystoscopy and self-learn by reflecting on the video recordings. Um, so what, what, I, what I do at the moment is uh, day case catheterless ureteric reimplants because I have virtually 100% resolution of the reflux, including in grade five reflux, um, where uh, not every patient I operate. So I do a lot of work um, in developing countries where um, the pathology is more extreme, the lateness of the presentation, uh, the management uh, of the patient after, after the operation is different. So I'm more inclined to use catheters in that setting, but still the majority of cases that I do even in that setting, um, I don't use a uh, ureteric or uh, urethral or suprapubic catheter. So I've gone away, having done a PhD in endoscopic management, I've gone away from using endoscopic management because of the success of day case catheterless ureteric green plants. Uh, thank you, Patty. I mean, uh, there, this is a follow-up question probably uh, for the um, uh, question that was raised about uh, temporary diversion. This has been asked by our colleague, uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser Said from Kuwait. He said, what about uh, uh, doing uh, uh, CIC as an alternative to visacostomy just to gain time uh, to, to have a definite treatment? Yeah, I think that's a, a very good suggestion. Um, but there, has, there, there tends to be um, uh, an attitude that boys, it's more dangerous because you might damage the urethra um, and older boys won't uh, do the intermittent catheterization anyway. But I, I, I think it's a very valid consideration so that doing a vesicostomy is the diversion that people were asking about before. Intermittent catheterization would be one of the um, bits of the armamentarium that I would have available for consideration. And for instance, if the family weren't able to cope with intermittent catheterization, that would be one of the reasons why I would decide that that wouldn't be a viable option. But no, I think it's a, a very good suggestion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Fahad. Hey, uh, Fadi, so there's a question from one of the audience. Do you use urodynamics or video urodynamic studies and evaluation of VUR or normal neurological children? Um, no, I, I don't tend to. Um, I try to look for the, the functional information uh, about the bladder from the history so that the, the girl with the spinning top urethra, the girl with the bladder instability, um, I tend not to take them to the theatre very much. So if they've got um, uh, minor changes in their kidneys, they've got um, minor thickening of their bladder. There are a four to six year old girl who's presented with recurrent urinary tract infections and wetting. Um, 
I don't tend to do a histogram on them in the first instance. Um, and I have a, a low threshold if I decide to investigate to actually do a cystoscopy where I will do some urodynamics while they're asleep when I might be doing a urethral dilatation as part of their management because they've failed anticholinergic treatment and at the same time looking at their ureteric orifices. So that's, that's if there's minimal ultrasound changes. If they've got more ultrasound changes, more ultrasound changes of the bladder as well, then I would be looking at the urodynamic function. So just a question. You mentioned in your presentation that you use the appearance of the ureteric orifice. So uh, does that mean you scope all your patients or who are the patients that you would prefer to scope? Are these the ones that you're planning to do surgical intervention and you do that intraoperatively? And how do you use that piece practically to tailor your management to these patients? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Um, what I effectively do is scope those patients I think I may not want to operate on. So I don't do many cystoscopies in children who uh, possibly got the psychiatric reflux. For instance, uh, um, just going back to a, a bit of a side discussion, but an important one. There was a study done in New Zealand um, some years ago where what they did was to do a suprapubic aspirate uh, in the neonatal nursery of those children who possibly had urinary tract infection. They ended up with 100 cases where they'd taken urine from the bladder to see whether they had infection. And then they um, injected contrast to see whether they had reflux. So, so they had 100 cases where um, they had confirmed infection, where they had 10 of those who had the psychiatric reflux. So that was a 10% incidence of the psychiatric reflux, where the normal incidence of the psychiatric reflux is much less than that. So that comes back to the prenatal hydronephrosis diagnosis and what to do. Um, the dilatation that might be associated with reflux is almost certainly associated with reflux that we don't need to know about. So my evaluation of those patients is driven by the fact that if you've got very minor changes that resolve early, then I don't know, I don't want to know whether they've got reflux because we probably don't have to do anything about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Diwan. There's another uh, question from Antonio Amaranti. Uh, he's asking when you reimplant wide ureters, do you think uh, there is a need for tailoring or do you think it is not necessarily? Uh, I it's like um, any aspect of the patient, um, there's always an outlier that you might find. Um, one of the things that I've changed my practice from what I was taught by my mentors is that with the wider ureter, the idea that you had to have a certain length to the ureter width ratio. Um, I've seen ureters that have been planted a long way up the other side of the bladder uh, because they were so big to start with and that has caused them to be obstructed. So that's never been a practice of mine. I tend to, when I operate on ureters that are relatively big, I put them into the, the normal position uh, at the end of the operation so that they're, they're basically swapped over left to right for a normal position. There are, however, cases where the ureter is so big that you do need to decrease it in size. What I usually manage to achieve though in those bigger uh, tortuous ureters is uh, narrowing them down simply by undoing that length so that you uh, create a slightly longer narrow so that any tube that is wide, if you stretch it, it becomes a little more narrow. But you know, there are obviously uh, more extreme examples that uh, do require reduction in the size of the ureter. Uh, so I, I do do that, but very infrequently. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, another question, uh, uh, which uh, by, by Dr. Mustafa Al Gamber, uh, as we know, I mean a coexistence between a reflux and obstruction probably uh, would probably dictate that we uh, manage both of them. However, keeping in mind that obstruction is is more harmful uh, on the developing kidneys, 
what would be your approach in case that there was an, a coexisting uh, urethropelvic junction obstruction with a low or intermediate grade uh, of reflux? Yeah. Um, like the case that I showed, uh, the reflux uh, in that little boy who presented with um, meningitis after a prenatal diagnosis, he, he clearly had insignificant reflux as judged by the lateral view of the ureter, the small size of the ureter, the small um, diameter all the way up until you got to that low PUJ. So in that case, it was clear that the reflux was incidental. But um, the case that was shown in the paper that uh, Marty Coyle suggested we read, that was a little less certain. There was high grade reflux into a big distended tortuous ureter and then there was a kink at the top end. In that kind of situation, um, you have to judge whether is it the PUJ is secondary to the reflux or is the PUJ an additional pathology? So the individual case, uh, I try to pick which is likely to be the more significant. And occasionally you do the reimplant and the hydronephrosis goes away. And I think that's one of the pieces of information that isn't out there. Uh, hydronephrosis has improved significantly if you re-implant high-grade reflux. So if, you'd, if I do the bottom end, I would do an ultrasound within a month to check that the upper tract had uh, diminished in the dilatation. If it looks like the PUJ is more likely to be the more significant than doing the pyeloplasty, uh, perhaps doing an endoscopy, although I tend to not try and instrument the lower tract. I don't use double J's routinely. I try not to use no catheters in um, uh, pyeloplasties, uh, more likely to with the psychiatric reflux. But I'd be trying to judge with all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle as to is the PUJ the most important problem? Is the, the psychiatric reflux the more important problem? or they equally so. And I certainly have uh, in the past had reimplant and pyeloplasty in the same patients where in some I've done the pyeloplasty first, in some I've done the reimplant first. The other, the other problem though, is that when you've got reflux and obstruction at the lower end, because one of the things our MAG3 studies are quite poor at, it's seeing whether or not there's obstruction at the lower end of the ureter. So I think that, that's when you have to come to ureteric peristalsis, ureterial thickening, width of the ureter, hyperperistalsis of the ureter. There's some of the parameters that I would go looking if I thought there might be reflux and obstruction at the bottom end. For the query PUJ and reflux, uh, I think just really carefully looking at all the information will uh, let you do one then the other uh, or both in quick succession. Okay, Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead, Fat. So another question for our colleague, Dr. Osama Sarhan. So a preterm girl who has solitary functioning kidney with grade 3 DUR and intrarenal reflux, chronic kidney disease with repeat urinary tract infections. Now she's a one year of age on prophylactic antibiotic and she's still getting febrile UTI. She's small for her age. So how would you approach such kids? Yeah, the, um, the intrarenal reflux is an interesting one. Um, I, the, the problem is because of the um, configuration of the papilla at the top and bottom, you can actually have reflux phenomenon through the x-ray. So the child who screamed when they're having a cystogram because the pressure in the bladder was so very high and they got intrarenal reflux because of the technique of the study, not because of their pathology. So the intrarenal reflux, I'd need to look at the cystogram. I'd need to take the, what I call the history of the investigation. So was it a well-tolerated cystogram or was it a cystogram that was really very distressful for the patient? So it was the technician that caused the intrarenal reflux rather than the pathology in the child. Um, grade three reflux in a younger child, um, I think can be many brands. It's a little, I think um, it was the grade three was the zebra in my presentation. I think grade three reflux in a very young child is very much a zebra collection. 
they can all look very different. So I would want to see um, how, uh, what happened with, was there early filling reflux uh, as um, we uh, saw uh, in a, one of the other presentations, was, was that present? What's the diameter of the lower ureter? What was the distance from the ureter, the back of the bladder in the oblique picture? And on the ultrasound, was there a ureter uh, easily seen? Was it hyperperistaltic? Was what, what do the calyces look like? So um, persistent reflux with persistent urinary tract infections in a one-year-old girl who's not growing, who perhaps has DMSA changes, that sounds like somebody I might operate on, but you can hear that I would need more detail before I could reach that conclusion. And I'll check for labial lesions. Thank you. Back to you, Ziad. Thank you, uh, Fahad. Um, uh, just a uh, follow-up, uh, Patty, about uh, your correlation uh, on lateral views about the width of the ureter and the anticipated probably uh, appearance or the morphological appearance of the urethral orifice. Uh, did you carry any sort of a study just to correlate that without the need of doing any sort of an inter, uh, invasive cystoscopic procedures? No, unfortunately, it's been one of my uh, career frustrations that I haven't actually done that. But um, I have uh, recently had a Zoom meeting with uh, Tej Matu, who's um, associated with the, the River Study. And apparently, they have a lot of cystograms because uh, in their unit, they did those views, which isn't done by all units. So there's a large body of material where we can at least look at reflux resolution rate compared to that lateral view. So I don't believe that study has actually been done yet. It's something where I've had the accumulated experience of seeing the endoscopy versus the radiology. And I feel I've got um, an understanding of it, but I haven't as yet uh, either seen nor done that study, which I've tried a couple of times to get uh, underway. And hopefully uh, through a discussion next week, we might uh, actually progress that study. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Antonio Amaranti. He's asking when you uh, deem uh, intervention by reimplantation is necessarily, uh, what would be your preference to go cross trigonal, politano, extra vesicle? And what would be your probably uh, guiding uh, idea in performing either one of those? Um, I was uh, trained in the Cohen reimplant, um, and I, I find it uh, a very straightforward, uh, easy procedure. So I haven't uh, the extravesical approach and the Politano lead better uh, approach. Um, I haven't. Um, I haven't had that early experience, and I'm. It's the Cohen reimplant is a very easy operation, uh, even when there's been deflux or Teflon injected previously. Um, it doesn't cause you too much problem to then do a transtrigonal, as long as you're careful with the mucosa as you make the tunnel to go across. And as I said, one of the lessons I've learnt um, beyond that of my mentors is. Don't try to make that tunnel too long. Um, you don't need to take it out to the side of the bladder. You just leave it in the base of the bladder. And the, the reflux resolution rate is extremely high and the relative ease of the operation and the patients can go home the same day comfortably in the majority of cases. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Fahad. Okay, uh, a scenario here in a, in a duplex system where there is an upper pole cyst that's non functioning and lower pole reflux in a patient with recurrent febrile UTI. Uh, a patient who's toilet trained, there's a girl, is running into recurrent febrile UTI. So, which moiety you would target and based on what you would approach such case? Yeah, um, there was a uh, an interesting case that came to me uh, recently, if I could just uh, allude to, to start with, it was now another 17-year-old girl who was diagnosed as having uh, a duplex system on the right side with what looked prenatally like it was going to be a non-functioning system. In fact, it was an ectopic ureter. Um, 
this girl also had grade two reflux on the left. And um, that resulted, that grade two reflux on the left has resulted in people subsequently labeling her as having reflux where she didn't have, she had reflux phenomenon on the left. She didn't have reflux on the right. She had an ectopic non-functioning system of the upper pole of the duplex on the right side. So she actually had four ureters, sorry, three ureters reimplanted when she was about four or five months of age. Um, I'm pleased to say not by myself. Um, so instead of taking out the non-functioning upper pole, which would have been what I probably would have done with that girl and not operated on her bladder, she's now ended up with multiple infections through her life with a non-functioning upper pole, where it's considered that her reflux has resolved and people haven't thought that perhaps if they took out the non-functioning upper pole of the right side, she probably would stop having infections. So coming back to this case, which is the non-functioning upper pole with the reflux, this is very much where I would go looking for extra parts of the jigsaw puzzle and scoping a patient like that. So looking at the anatomy of the reflux in that lateral view, looking at the ultrasound anatomy of the ureter to uh, uh, judge, um, you know, is it, is it a, a duplex system with a urethra seal? Is it a duplex system with ectopia um, or not? Um, I would tend to judge what I would do about the reflux on the basis of endoscopy, probably. Uh, if I was thinking that the upper pole was probably being taken away, um, scoping the lower end while possibly taking out the upper pole and then uh, possibly doing both ends by re-implanting the bottom uh, end and taking out the rest of the ureter. But I, I, if you can hear that I don't have enough information to be able to make the decision that upper pole heminephrectomy, if there's reflux that is significant or a urethra seal that's still large as well as the reflux, then I might operate on the bottom end as well. Great. Back to you, Dr. Ziad. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, probably we had uh, the last two uh, or one questions, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to the spinning uh, top urethra, um, uh, are you going to be concerned uh, of uh, being aggressive in evaluating those children uh, differently compared to those with a normal appearing urethra, especially, I mean, uh, when we're speaking about girls. Because what we have experienced is that, especially uh, uh, a toilet trained uh, girls, when they have the um, uh, ability to go for an invasive BCUG, they would tend always to construct their, their uh, external sphincter. And that would probably would simulate uh, a spinning uh, top urethra. So, uh, I mean, what, what would be your comment on that? Uh, because sometimes I feel that, that it might be a normal sort of a physiological uh, appearance rather than to anything that would indicate any kind of pathological underlying cause. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment. Um, in girls who present with wetting infections, and most of the ones I see are sort of six to eight years old and it's been going on for some time, um, if they've got minimal changes in their kidney, um, I will manage them with uh, high fluid intake, frequent voiding, anticholinergics, and most importantly, explaining the bladder spasm phenomenology to them. Um, I very rarely do cystograms on those girls. And I see a lot of girls with uh, bladder instability like that. So I very rarely um, see girls and then send them for a cystogram if they've got uh, recurrent urinary tract infections, if it's in the context of probable bladder instability with an ultrasound that only has very minimal changes. I would prefer to send them off for a DMSA. And then if the DMSA, accepting my comment about a little bit of lack of sensitivity. If they've got minimal hydronephrosis, the DMSA is normal uh, and they're coming under control with conservative management, particularly if their wetting is getting better, then I would tend to be not doing a cystogram so that I'm not getting that issue of being 
finding lots of girls with a spinning, minimal spinning top urethra who's got a little bit of reflux because I'm not actually getting to the point of identifying that. And I think that's why I don't, I don't see much grade two, grade, grade two, minor, grade three, the psychiatric reflux, because I think I'm managing conservatively these girls whose reflux doesn't matter because it's actually bladder pathology that's the problem and it's reflux phenomenon, not reflux disease. Except those two cases that I showed with the extreme um, dilatation. So occasionally I will take a girl to theatre because she's not responding to those conservative means. So I'm more likely to do a cystoscopy than I am to do a cystogram. And if they've been recalcitrant to the conservative management of their bladder instability, I'll add urethral dilatation. And, but when I talk to the families, I indicate that I expect that if I need to do a urethral dilatation, which is in a very small proportion of my patients, that it, there's about a 50% chance that they'll have a significant improvement. So I then tend not to do it because it's the other measures that uh, lead to success rather than the dilatation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patty. I mean, it's been uh, very enlightening, as I mentioned, uh, listening uh, to you with your huge, vast experience in this topic. And it's really been a pleasure for us all to participate and, uh, and learn from you. I would uh, thank you again for your time that you allowed for us. And uh, we wish you all the best. Hopefully that we're going to continue uh, collaborating and working uh, to hear uh, from you anything that will be probably enriching to our experiences. As, and as, as I always say, that it is always uh, nice to hear from an expertise uh, all over the world about different kind of approach uh, to common uh, etiologies that we deal with uh, on a daily basis. So uh, on behalf of uh, all of my colleagues, I would like to thank you, and I will hand it now back to Fahad, uh, for a concluding remarks. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Ziad. So thanks, uh, Professor Diwan, for your uh, great presentation. And on behalf of the Saudi Pediatric Urology Group and the Saudi Urology Association, I would like to thank you. And as a closing remark and disclosure, in the Saudi Pediatric Urology Group, we welcome all opinions as long as it's sticking to that individualized approach of care to patients with VOR based on risk participation is a key. Also appreciating VOR as a spectrum of disease and a spectrum of patients, so we can't paint all patients with the same color. Uh, and you elaborate on that nicely in the presentation. And also understanding and applying evidence-based approach to management, uh, respecting the different guidelines and protocols and different personal opinions. So in the SPUG, we welcome all expertise opinion from all over the world and it's one of our mission to convey knowledge and experience to our pediatric urology community across the world. So thank you for our audience for their attendance and hopefully this was a uh, this was helpful and fruitful discussion and looking forward to future sessions and we wish you all the best and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone.